Today's episode of Socially Democratic is presented to you by Dunn Street. Dunn Street partners with businesses, organisations, unions and social democratic parties across the globe to develop community organising strategies and train leaders to build power from within their community. And in 2021, Dunn Street will continue to work with folks that want to share their stories, inspire others, take action, give hope and organise communities for change. To find out how you can partner with Dunn Street, hit us up at dunnstreet.com.au. And before we get into today's podcast, if you've had to take time off work because of injury or illness, then you need a strong player on your team. Morris Blackburn is Australia's number one super claims law firm. They can check if your insurance is uh, as part of your super and help you make a super TPD claim. Morris Blackburn fights for fair. Call them on one 800 triple two or go to morrisblackburn.com. Au. Hello and welcome to another episode of Socially Democratic, your weekly centre-left politics and organising podcast that dives into the progressive issues, campaigns of the day and the people leading them from home and abroad. And on this week's episode, we're uh, going to be rejoined by a guest that we had on um, not so long ago, uh, Itai F- uh, Flesher, who is a journalist with um, uh, Plus 61J in uh, in Jerusalem. He's also the education director for Kids for uh, sorry Kids for Peace in Jerusalem, which is a youth movement that supports uh, young Israeli and Palestinian kids. Um, obviously, uh, in the news in the last you know three or four weeks, has been a, a flare up and a tensions and escalation of violence in the Middle East between Israel and Palestine. And uh, it's a it, look. It's not an easy topic to to cover. Um, it's very heated. A lot of people have. Uh, opinions. A lot of people managed to get those opinions down to a very simple meme and put it up on Instagram. <coughs> um, so we thought we would unpack those memes and actually get uh, Itai on today's show to talk us through how the hell we got back to another cycle of escalating violence in the Middle East. Um, and so we appreciate him coming on the show to talk to us about that. Uh, don't forget to uh, subscribe to the podcast on uh Instagram, sorry, yeah, on uh, what do you call it? On, um, on, uh, f- um, I've just lost my notes again. This has been one of the worst introductions I think I've ever done. Um, don't forget to subscribe to us on um, pod on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, uh, SoundCloud, or Stitcher, and to follow Dunn Street uh, on our social media platforms, including Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and LinkedIn. Oh my God! Let's just get to today's episode. Okay, we're taping this one on a Wednesday afternoon in uh, downtown Melbourne and uh, uh, joining me on the line from uh, Jerusalem is uh, the Jerusalem journalist for Plus 61J uh, and is also a, uh, the education director for uh, Kids for Peace Jerusalem, which is a youth movement for Israeli and Palestinian youths. Um, he's been on the show before, but uh, it's great to welcome you back onto Socially uh, Democratic Itai Flesher. Welcome back. Thank you. It's good to be here. Now, the last time I had you on the show, I said, um, because I loved the conversation talking about the Israeli uh, elections, and I said, um, you know, I think you'll be back on pretty soon because you'll have elections again quite soon, making a a stupid joke. Unfortunately, you're actually back on the show, but not under great circumstances because of obviously the uh, what's going on in the Middle East um, at the moment. But we certainly do appreciate uh, you taking time out of your day to come on to the show and talk to us. Uh, about what um, has been happening um, in your neighbourhood in the last couple of um, weeks. My first question really is to ask, first of all, is um, how are you and your family going um, since uh, the conflict escalated uh, over a fortnight ago? So thanks for asking. And look, my family is, is OK. I, I live in, in Jerusalem in the in the Emek Rafaim neighbourhood um, where we thankfully haven't you know, experienced... Uh, violence. There weren't rocket attacks in in this area. Specifically, there was one rocket on Jerusalem on the first day of the war. But aside from that, you know, I was fine. But d- definitely for my kids, um, you know, they had obviously their school excursions cancelled. The camping trip was cancelled. The most schools, pretty much for the two weeks of the war in Israel, didn't allow any outdoor um, activities um, because you know they wanted kids to be indoors so they could be close to. Um, 
the, the to a bomb shelter. It's, it was almost like the opposite of Corona. You know, for for for, ye- for the whole past year, they've actually said do everything outdoors. You know, so my kids were doing it school outdoors, and now that you know, obviously changed to move everything to indoors. Um, but you know, a lot of people in the country obviously experienced uh, the war in a, in a much more terrible way than I did, and I'll I'll speak about that as we go on. Well, I mean, that's great. To, certainly great to hear that um, things are things are certainly okay with uh, with your family. So I'm pleased to hear that. Look, and I, uh, when this happened, I must admit, I thought to myself, uh, do we do a podcast on this issue because it is such a complex and long-standing geopolitical conflict um, that to, to I don't think you can do it justice in a you know 40 minute 50 minute podcast um, but I certainly want to give it a crack and I think the thing that drove me to wanting to do it is I was getting sick of people trying to sum up the conflict in a meme <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> which is the complete opposite of a like uh, having a conversation so um, I do I do appreciate you um, coming on the show to talk about it today um, how did this how did this contemporary conflict, how did this particular war uh, kick off in recent weeks? And even as I ask that question, I know that in some ways we're not going to satisfy both sides with the answer, but can you start to at least give us some enlightenment to exactly how did it, um, how did this conflict escalate to the point that, you know, both um, Israel and Hamas are firing rockets at each other? So, it's interesting to look at the names of the war. I think that tells you a lot. You know, in Israel, it was called Shomer Chomot, Guardian of the Walls, and Hamas called it Sword of Jerusalem. So you can clearly see here that, that both sides are referring to the walls of Jerusalem in the, their name of the war. So um, I think I think in that sense, it's clear that the events of the past month in Jerusalem leading up to, to when it began on May the 6th was was a trigger. So there was there was three things that, that happened in the last month that all of them, you know, I covered and I visited all the places as well. Um, the first was um, around the Damascus Gate. The Damascus Gate, for those that haven't been to Jerusalem, is the main entrance way to the to the old city to get to the Al-Aqsa Mosque, which is a, a holy site uh, for Muslims. And especially during Ramadan, it's a place where tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of people uh, want to pray each night as they as they break the fast, and it's also the site of the former Jewish temple, um, making it the holiest site in the world for Jews as well. So that's why it's a contested place. So um, we're right at the end of Corona now. So we almost everyone is vaccinated. It's not really an issue, but there's still a little bit of Corona around. We had like 12 cases yesterday. Or I know in Victoria you would lock down for that, but here that's considered a huge achievement for us because we used to have thousands a day. So the the police decided for, for a bit for corona reasons and a bit for crowd control reasons that they wouldn't allow gathering around the steps of um, of Damascus Gate. And for Palestinians, this felt like is like saying don't gather at Fed Square on Australia Day or something. You know, it's, for them, it's like this big public area where that's where you go and that's where you hang out and there's food stalls and clothing and you know it's a social place. And they felt that they're their cultural place was being taken away from them. So for the first 13 nights of Ramadan, every night there was clashes between mainly young Palestinian boys and Israeli police over what they felt was their right to be able to sit at the at the Damascus Gate. And then after 13 days, Israel eventually lifted um, the, the barriers and they were able to sit at the Damascus Gate for the, for the rest of Ramadan. And so... That was, you know, people thought, okay, there was a clash and it's over. You know, it's kind of been it's been resolved after sort of Israel Israel back down there. And then the next issue that came out was was the Sheikh Jarrah neighbourhood, um, which I'll talk about in, in the next question. And then the last issue was um, the the issue of the Al Aqsa Mosque. So um, on the on the mosque, as I mentioned, tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands, of people want to pray there. Uh, during Ramadan, and um, the, the last few days of Ramadan, which are the holiest nights um, of the festival, there were several clashes on the mount. According to the Israeli narrative, um, this was provoked by Palestinians throwing stones at Israeli soldiers and also stones down at the Kotel with the Western Wall where Jews were praying, um, and then the soldiers felt that they had to go on the mount to respond to this violence. According to the Palestinian narrative, this was an unprovoked assault on a holy place where soldiers were coming in with uh, tear gas and uh, and stun grenades and even rubber bullets and um, 
and 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 going into a mosque, into you know the, one of the holiest places, uh, it's the third holiest site in the world for Muslims, and there was a great sense of desecrating a holy place that that a soldier would use, you know, ammunition in 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 a holy place was was considered you know a, a violation of, of Muslim law, um, and then and then that that resulted in on on May the sixth Hamas firing. The first rocket of the war was actually fired at Jerusalem, um, and uh, I was actually at home on a Zoom call at the time, and uh, very not expecting it because um, whilst Israel has had rockets before, they very rarely are fired at Jerusalem, um, and uh, and then and then that's where you know and that's where everything went on from there. Um, I will say that in the in the Israeli imagination, I guess. Uh, they would say that the war has nothing to do with those three things that I mentioned um, in Israel, that the common thought is that the reason Hamas attacked Israel is because Hamas is a, you know, anti-Semitic genocidal terrorist organization that just wants to destroy Israel. But within the narrative Hamas and definitely of Palestinians within Israel and also Palestinians in the West Bank and Gaza, they would say those three issues are the triggers that caused Hamas to sort of stand up to protect Jerusalem. So the, the, the one that you did mention there, uh, which I wanted to ask you about, was the property rights dispute for the neighbourhood in East Jerusalem, which I am going to pronounce and destroy it terribly, and I apologise. Yeah. Uh, mm. sh- uh, Chef Jarrah, how was that? Yes. Thank yeah, you. that's pretty good. Yeah. Thank, you, thank you. Walk us through the history of, the, the, of, this, of this dispute and why uh, had it impacted on the, the tensions within Jerusalem in the last couple of weeks? So the Shashaf neighborhood is about 10 minutes north of the old city. Um, I, I work there. My office is in Shashaf for Kids for Peace. Uh, I've been working there for the past three years. I go there every day. Um, and so I, it's a neighborhood I know reasonably well. Um, so within that neighborhood, there's a tomb of a Jewish sage called Shimon Hatzadik. He lived 2,000 years ago. He was one of the priests in the temple. And so... For, for for many years, that was probably from the Middle Ages or so. That was a pilgrimage site um, for Jews to come and pray at the at the tomb of this holy man. Um, interestingly, archaeologically, I'm almost sure it's not him who's buried in this tomb because it was probably someone else, and then probably about 500 years ago it became his tomb. But that happens with a lot of tombs in this place. But that's a whole other story. But there's a, there's a belief at least that this man is buried there. And so in 1875, a group called the Yemenite Association and the Ashkenazi Association, they bought a, a giant block of land around this tomb um, to, you know, for pilgrims to come and, and worship the tomb and visit there and pray there and they had festivals and that sort of thing. Um, and then uh, in 1948, uh, there was a war um, where during that war, what Israel would call the War of Independence or Palestinians would call the Nakba, the catastrophe, um, the Jews that were living in the eastern side of the city were expelled or left, depending on your narrative, and moved to West Jerusalem. And the Palestinians who were living on the western side of the city in neighborhoods like Baka, Qatam, Montalbia, um, and then also around the whole country in, in Akka and in Yaffa and Lid and lots of other places, um, they, were, they also became refugees. 700,000 Palestinians became refugees in the Nakba. And um, and there was this, I guess, like population transfer. You know, people moved from one side of the city based on on where the the ceasefire lines were were resolved in in 1949. So uh, Jordan, who then controlled this site now around the tomb, um, decided to give they the blocks was divided into 28 blocks of land and 28 families who were refugees from that war were given homes in 1956. And in exchange for them getting this refugee, uh, getting these homes, they gave up their refugee status. So they stopped being listed as refugees because they now had homes in, in the Shachara neighbourhood. And um, and Gordon made a mistake, though, and that's a big part of this conflict, is that they never registered the land directly to these people. So, so no, no one got a document saying... Like when you buy a house, you have a deed that says this is your house and it's got your name on it. They never got that. They just got the land and um, for whatever reason, it wasn't registered. Mm. Then mm. Uh, in 1967, Israel captures East Jerusalem in the Six-Day War, occupies as most of the world would consider it, um, and and then uh, the, the families there 
then um, the, the Jewish owner, you know, the prior Jewish owners, they want the land back. And so in 1970, Israel passes a law that says that any uh, Jew who once owned land in East Jerusalem can evict the, the owners of that land um, and reclaim it for themselves. But, and this is important, there isn't a law that allows Palestinians to reclaim their land from West Jerusalem. It's basically a law that, whilst it doesn't say Jew or Arab in it, neither law does, the 1950 law, the 1970 law, it's a law that discriminates against Palestinian and in favour of, of Israelis. Um, and so while everything I'm saying here is legal, it's based on a law that's not a fair law. Mm. Um, because it doesn't, it doesn't treat, not everyone has the same property rights in Jerusalem. So then um, in, in, the, in 1982, there's an agreement between the Palestinians who live in Sheftarat and the people that own the land that the people in Sheftarat can stay there, provided they pay rent, like a symbolic kind of rent, to the Jewish owners, and they have what's called a protected tenancy status. That means that they, they're not the owners of the house, but they, they're, allowed to, they're allowed to stay there. Um, and the residents don't pay rent. They, they say, we don't recognise the Israeli occupation. It's illegal under international law. We don't recognise the fact that it's your homes. You know, we were given these homes in 1956 from the Jordanians. We're not paying you rent. And then there's a series of court cases. I won't go through all of them because they literally go for 40 years, leading up to May 6th. What happens on May 6th is there is meant to be on May 6th a verdict to um, evict for Palestinian families from their homes. Now, this has already gone through all of the lower courts, and all of the lower courts have ruled in favour of the, the Jewish settlers that want to remove them from their homes. And on May 6, you're meant to get the final verdict um, of the Supreme Court. And and legally, the residents don't have a leg to stand on. You know, like legally, I'm almost sure that the case will be ruled in favour of the Jewish settlers. But morally, they argue that it's the reason they don't have a legal leg to stand on is because the law that the court is interpreting is, is not a law that's a fair law. It's a law that, that allows Jews to reclaim property in East Jerusalem, but doesn't allow Palestinians to reclaim property in West Jerusalem. And that is what um, then then triggered the, you know, the Hamas firing, firing the rockets, at least in their narrative. And I will say for Palestinians, even though I'm not Palestinian, uh, I've spoken to many Palestinians about Sheikh Jarrah, and many of them feel like what's happening in this neighbourhood is the Nakba all over again. For, for them, this brings up a sense that Israel is trying to, um, you know, in 1948 it was by force and now it's by legal means, but trying to make East Jerusalem more Jewish in order to prevent East Jerusalem from becoming the capital of Palestine and prevent um, prevent them from living their lives in the way they are. And so the reason why many Palestinians are worried about Sheikh Jarrah is because they say, even though now it's only four houses, what if it's my house next month or next year? Or, you know, there's already, there's a court case in Silwan today, which is another neighbourhood in East Jerusalem, and there's a fear that this might start, you know, if the court rules in favour of the settlers now in, in Sheikh Jarrah, it could, it could start a wave of, of house removals from, from other neighbourhoods in East Jerusalem, and that's, and that's the fear. And again, in the Israeli narrative, um, if you look at all of the statements from the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and members of the Jerusalem City Council, they will say this is a real estate dispute between a tenant and a landlord over non-payment of rent, and there's nothing there's nothing political about it. In the same way that you have property disputes anywhere else in the world. Jerusalem Day uh, marks the reunification of the Holy City after the end of the Six Day War and. 1967 and that was celebrated just recently and i read a lot of reports that in the days leading up to it you mentioned before about um you know um, young palestinian kids piling stockpiling rocks uh in the alaska mosque and at the same time you've got religious nationalist jews sort of marching through the city in the lead up to the celebration of jerusalem day how much of an impact did these two young sort of groups have in escalating the tensions um that led to then the war so I spent most of the day in and around the old city of Jerusalem on Jerusalem Day. Uh, I'll say a few things. Um, firstly, it's it's always a tense day because, as as you mentioned, for, for Jewish modern Orthodox Zionist Jerusalem, which is not the majority of the city, but that part of the city, and then also the many modern Orthodox religious youth that come from around the country to march with flags on Jerusalem, it's not... It's not just a day of celebration, it's also a day celebrating a conquest and a dispossession of 
the Palestinian people from from Jerusalem, especially from the Kotel, um, which was once um, the Western Wall, where there was the Mugrabi neighborhood there, was a Palestinian neighborhood in front, and now the plaza where Jews from all over the world come to, to pray and worship. And it's really, you know, many, many young Jewish boys and girls come from all over the world to have their, their bar and bat mitzvah there. And, and there's, a, there's a sense of great joy that this has finally returned to the Jewish people. And, and I'd say few Jews would visit that place without tearing up or feeling emotional given given that it's, you know, it's the last remaining wall of the former Jewish temple. And that's, and that's really what's being celebrated on Jerusalem. Sadly, within the people celebrating, there are a group of ultra-Jewish nationalists that celebrate it by marching through Arab areas and chanting really awful slogans, you know, Muhammad is dead, death to Arabs, death to terrorists, um, you know, Mishema Amin Lamefached, whoever believes isn't afraid, Amanetzach Lamefached, the... The eternal nation isn't afraid, but you know, it's kind of nationalistic um, slogans that that kind of affirm to the Palestinians that this is ours and this is not yours. Mm. And then, obviously, Palestinians will respond to that with 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 violence. Or, in fact, when I was in the old city around two in the afternoon, every Arab shop had closed. You know, they they were just like, we don't <laughs> we don't want any problems. And the area looked like a ghost town about an hour before the march. Um, and so what Israel did was, um, firstly, there were two things. There was a group called Tag Meir, which is a, a sort of more left-wing Jewish group. And about two hours before the Nationalist March, they marched through the old city with flowers to sort of try and promote tolerance and coexistence and say, we are, we are Jews. There was about 400 Jews there kind of saying, we believe Jerusalem should belong to everyone. These flowers are a symbol of peace. And then, you know, a few hours later, tens of thousands of people marched through the old city with um, with Israeli flags, but um, in order to not cause trouble, Israel actually rerouted the march. So instead of going through the Damascus Gate, which is the Muslim quarter, it went through the Jaffa Gate and the Zion Gate. So the Israeli government was sort of trying to um, not, you know, pour oil on the flame by making sure that march didn't go through the the area, hoping that that would sort of calm down the the people who were upset about this march happening in the first place, that obviously didn't calm down Hamas because they still fired rockets anyway. But but that was that that was what happened on that day. I've got a bunch of questions that I wanted to ask you about that are sort of more at a sort of a, 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 a geopolitical kind of global uh, sense because you've given us a good picture of what things were like on the ground. But then obviously there are m- multiple levels in this conflict and I want to start to sort of unpick those and pose them to you more as a narrative from different sides and get your sense of um, yeah. the impact that, it, that it's having. Uh, the first one is that how much responsibility does, you know, do you think the Israeli government can bear in terms of allowing this to escalate on the streets of Jerusalem, particularly the actions of the local police during those final critical days in uh, in the holy month of Ramadan. So there's in Israel there's a there's a very extreme um, politician that was elected in the last election that he, he kind of likes Pauline Hanson look moderate. Um, his name is Itamar Ben Gvir and he's from the Religious Zionism Party. And um, he opened up his office in Sheikh Jarrah, opposite the homes of the Palestinian families that were going to be expelled. And there's videos of him kind of yelling at them in Hebrew, Zeshelano, Zeshelano, like this land is ours. And so when, when you get an ultra-nationalist politician going to the most sensitive neighbourhood, setting up an office there with a flag and, and saying, you know, this is our, you know, he's, it's clearly a provocative act. And this is someone that Netanyahu wants to be in his coalition. Um, and Netanyahu didn't condemn, you know, this behaviour. The police chief did, by the way. The police chief said that Itamar Ben Gvir shouldn't be doing this, and this is just going to inflame tensions. But, uh, but you know, he he did this. You know, some of his followers in a group called Lehava were marching through the city and saying death to Arabs. Um, you know, a couple of weeks ago, about 300 of them, which you know, kind of had echoes of Charlottesville in in the in the sense of you know. I, kind of, I, I was really frightened just to see that happening in Jerusalem because the majority of Jewish Jerusalem does not think like that. Um, but, but, you know, a very extremist thing. And then, then obviously on the Palestinian side, there's a, there's, a, there's a sense of we need to defend Jerusalem. Jerusalem is under attack. And the Palestinians don't have an army in Jerusalem. They don't have police. Um, and so they feel like the way they can defend themselves is through rocks and stones and, and also demonstrations and chanting and waving Palestinian flags and, and that sort of thing. Um, and then, and then you get to the to the clashes where they were. So, 
Um, you know, if we had leaders that wanted to calm things down, I think that would be that would be better on both sides. But for, for various reasons, a, a big one is also I, sh I should mention that there was meant to be a Palestinian election as well, um, which was meant to happen on May 22nd, uh, which Mahmoud Abbas cancelled. And it, it seems quite clear that Hamas was actually going to do very well in that election. And the reason the election was cancelled is Mahmoud Abbas didn't want to lose it. This is a guy who hasn't had an election for 17 years, by the way. Um, and so I think there was a lot of hope and there was a lot of people organising before the election. I think it was like 30 parties that already registered to run. And then, and then especially for Hamas, I think they felt like we were going to express our voice and, and the many other people who don't like Fatah and, and the PLO, we were going to express our, our voice through these elections. And then these elections got taken away from us. So, so what's our way to express our voice? Well, everything else you saw in the past month. Yeah, I mean, that's, that was the next question I was going to ask you about that. I mean, how much did the cancelling of the Palestinian elections uh, impact on, on, on the conflict? And it's just, you know, like the Fatah Party at an international level are a sister party with the, all the Labor and Social Democratic parties uh, around the world. They are a member of the International Progressive Alliance, which is yeah. the Australian Labor Party and the Labor Party in the UK, the Israeli Labor Party, um, the Democrats, all of those kind of... Uh, um, left-wing parties are uh, affiliated to. So they're, they're, they're a sister party. Yeah. And as a liberal Democrat, as in a person who believes in democracy, you know, you want to see democracy flourish. And you did make the point that Mahmoud Abbas is serving um, you know, the 16th year of, of a four-year term, which I think a lot of mm -hmm. politicians would be quite jealous about, quite frankly. <laughs> if I don't have to have as many elections, then that's going to be great for me. But, yeah, yeah. Um, you know, the you, you want democracy to flourish in the Palestinian uh, um, uh, authority and, 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 and in the West Bank and in Gaza but then the risk is that they lose and it falls into the hands of um, more fundamentalist right. groups. Right. And look, the deputy mayor of Jerusalem explicitly said in an interview that she didn't want the elections to happen, that she didn't want people of East Jerusalem to vote either um, because she doesn't want people of East Jerusalem to feel like they belong to the Palestinian Authority. And she also was also fearful of the election. So, so I'm sure... Uh, I'm sure there were probably many other Israelis that were happy that that election didn't happen as well. Yeah. The next question I'm going to ask you about is the uh, um, the, Abraham, the Abraham Accords um, and what level of frustration has that created for the Palestinian leadership? And for maybe for, for listeners at home, you can explain to us what those accords were and the, the um, international diplomatic strategy that Israel has taken in terms of trying to broaden a new path of Arab Jewish relations in the Middle East and trying to end this perpetual violence how much how much of that has that impacted on uh, the role that the Palestinian leadership plays within their own community mm. so the, the Abraham Accords were normalization agreements signed between Trump and the and the UAE and uh, um, Bahrain uh, in exchange for recognizing the, the state of Israel and also then allow them to open up um, trade with the, with the United States at a much higher level, specifically around issues of weapons and defense. Um, and then after the first two countries, there were two other countries that joined on later, being Morocco and Sudan. They're, 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 Sudan hasn't been finalized. It's in the process at the moment, but it is they're heading towards normalization uh, with Israel, so now, for example, you can fly from Israel to Dubai, something that you couldn't do uh, until until a few months ago. And and I think I think Trump was a very key factor because I think a lot of these countries felt that if Trump wasn't there, this is not something that we could necessarily do. And that's why they a lot of them happened, you know, towards the really the last few months of his term in office. Um, and within in Netanyahu, you know, I think he I think the left in Israel has always argued you can't ha make peace. With without making peace with the Palestinians, you know you, you, that's that's the per you, you make peace with your enemy. You don't make peace with your friends. Mm -hmm. And Netanyahu, you know, his whole campaign was, I've shown that I can make peace with the Arabs without making peace with the Palestinians. I've shown that I can bring normalization agreements in several countries and recognition from around the world um, without without sort of ending the occupation or removing settlements or any of those sorts of things. And, um, and, you know, for a while, a lot of Israelis believe that, you know, and a lot of Israelis thought maybe we are living in an era of peace. And I think Netanyahu was, those Abraham Accords were very popular in Israel. Even many of the parties on the left supported them 
uh, as well, um, because there was that sense of, well, you know, in, any peace agreement is always better and, you know, you never know what it will, the impact it will have down the road in the future. And I think what, what this last month has reminded us is, is that having peace with, with Dubai of Iran does not stop uh, Hamas from firing rockets um, or, or, or also, I mean, the, the internal violence within Israel, which I'll speak about in a minute, but um, that, that ultimately to have peace, you need to make peace with the people that you live, this, live in this land with and that you share this land with. Um, and that as wonderful as peace might be with countries somewhere else in the Gulf, that's not, that's not enough. There's a narrative that I've read in uh, some of the uh, Israeli papers in the last couple of weeks is that the, the key funders of Hamas, Turkey and Iran, obviously are not keen on seeing uh, a new path forward in terms of Arab-Jewish relations. And that right. uh, these, this escalation and this war in part was to show the rest of the world that yeah. um, Israel is not a partner in peace in the Middle East, that they are the, the, this aggressor. And, and let's just like, let's just, just uh, I guess by, th- fi- by Hamas starting to fire rockets into uh, Jerusalem or into Israel, they know they're not going to win, but they know they're going to get a response. And it's the response that will right. impact those relationships. Yeah, you're right. Look, uh, on the last day of the war, Hamas, uh, the day after the war, Hamas released a statement saying they'd won the war. And in the statement where they said they'd won the war, they said one of the things that they said they've achieved is we will, um, we've made sure that no other Arab country will normalise relations with Israel. So we've stopped this. You know, if there were any other Arab countries considering it, they're not going to do this now. Interestingly, also the day after the war ended, Amit Segal, who is um, sort of a well-known right-wing political commentator in Israel, he said, he said, on Sunday, Israel is going to have to make two decisions. The first is, is it going to allow Jews to pray um, on the Al-Aqsa Mosque, uh, near the Al-Aqsa Mosque, which is, again, for Jews, the Temple Mount, the, the, the holiest site in the world for the Jewish people? And is it going to let the courts approve the evictions from Sheikh Jarrah? He said quite clearly, if Israel doesn't do these two things, allow Jews to pray on the Temple Mount and evict people from Sheikh Jarrah, then Hamas has won. Um, Now, interestingly, on Sunday morning, Israel did allow Jews again to pray uh, on the Temple Mount around the Al-Aqsa Mosque. There were some clashes when that happened, but about, I think, 50 to 100 Jews did did pray, uh, not pray on that site, sorry, they they, they sort of toured the site, but they didn't sort of hold uh, a prayer because you're not allowed to pray um, on the site. Um, the Sheikh Jarrah decision, again, we'll know in two weeks what, where, the, where the Supreme Court rules, and I, I'm guessing there, there may be some intervention from the Attorney General, Abichai Mandelblit, in, in that case now that it's so politically sensitive. But there is a sense, I guess, for the right wing in Israel that we can't make any concessions on Sheikh Jarrah or, or the Temple Mount because this will, this will show that... Uh, Hamas won, and and Israel wants to the, the right wing government for sure wants to tell its people that we won, and these are the two core issues where I guess they can say we won. In addition to obviously stopping Hamas from being able to fire rockets at Ashdod and Ashkelon, and so many of the residents of the south that have you know suffered terribly not just in the last month but for over twenty years from these rockets. Um. Uh, one of the mo- most disturbing reports, I think. I mean, there's a lot of it's disturbing, so I'm not trying to. Um have some sort of um, moral Olympics here, but one of the st- disturbing reports I thought coming out of it was the violence that the internecine violence that was springing up in mixed Jewish Arab towns in Israel, where the majority population is Arab, like towns like Lod, where we're seeing riots um, between the community synagogues being um, torched, mobs attacking, um, you know, um, an, an old Arab man, uh, reports of him being lynched. Uh, you know, this is uh, one of the uh, j- journalists, uh, one of the uh, Israeli journalists reported about th- that. I think he said that the the existential crisis for Israel is not Hamas, but it is our internals. That if we cannot keep peace within our communities, then that's going to be a problem for Israel going forward. Mm-hmm. How, how is this something that leadership within the Israeli government would that they would sit up and go, okay, this is not great. We need to we need to to, to address this. Because I don't think I get a feeling from Bibi that he really does care about ending this cycle of violence that exists. This flare-ups that happen every four or five years between Israel and Hamas. But is yeah. he going to be? Is he going to pay attention to what's going on in his own country? So yeah, a few things. Firstly, the you know, there was also a civil war here in addition to the war with Hamas. You're right in in Ramla, in Lod, in Akko, and Haifa, and so many of the in the mixed cities. 
there, there was violence. There was uh, in Batyam, there was a lynching. An Arab man was was pulled out of his car and beaten with with sticks and clubs almost to an inch of 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 his life uh, purely because he was an Arab. And and one of the people you know involved in this lynching, this happened live on television, by the way. Um, and one of the people who beat him up was interviewed later, and they said, well, "Why are you beating up a random person?" He said, "Well, the Arabs are firing rockets." At us, so I have to I have to find an Arab to to kind of uh, to to show that that I'm not going anywhere, that I'm that I'm here, that I'm here to stay. You know, like crazy rhetoric. Because what does an Arab in Batyam have to do with Hamas? Like, you know, it's a ridiculous argument. At the same time, in in Lod, you know, there were several synagogues burnt. Um, just you know, synagogues where no one was in them, but like just burning synagogues. There was. There was uh, stones were thrown at at Jews. There was also a number of lynchings of Jews in Akko. Almost every single Jewish uh, restaurant or business in the old city was was destroyed. You know, glass smashed, etc. So um, yeah, really, really horrific, uh, horrific internal violence. Um, and and again, Hamas very much saw that as a victory of saying, you know, the we've united the West Bank. You know, forty eight uh, Israel and sixty seven. Um, by, you know, by by bringing everyone together under our leadership, and that and that again is, in a way, it's them waging election politics without an election, um, and uh, and especially someone that works in a civil society organisation where you know this happened before in October two thousand, and a lot of civil society groups formed to kind of say you know we need to work better on making this country a home for everyone, Jews and Arab men and women. Um, making sure that everyone feels equal here. There were many dialogue groups, joint Jewish Arab schools formed in result in 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 response to this. Um, and and there's a great sense of what happened here. In 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 terms of Netanyahu, you know, when this happened, Netanyahu issued a very strong statement on live television saying, "I condemn all violence. No one should be beating anyone up. This is not our way." But then on you, on the other hand, look at what he's done for the last 20 years. Look at the at the people he sits in coalition with, look at the Jewish nation state law that he passed that, uh, you know, demotes the status of Arabic in the country, look at the, the Nakba law, look at you know, various other laws and, and rhetoric that comes from people within his own party that is extremely anti-Arab. So on the one hand, he condemns the violence, but on the other hand, he he lays he lays the, the framework for... Um, for delegitimizing, I guess, Arabs from being part of the coalition, even though the Ram Party very much wants to be part of the coalition, um, but also delegitimizing um, Arabs as, as citizens as well as calling them terrorist supporters and that sort of thing. And, you know, when you push and push enough, then you get these responses. On the other hand, nothing justifies burning a synagogue or, or beating up a Jew on the street or, or these sorts of things. So, um, again, it's, it's a very complicated situation, but... I don't think Netanyahu has been in any way a unifying leader or a leader that's tried to, um, you know, he, he's only sort of calming down the flames after they're, they're well and truly lit. This is a, a simplistic question um, that I'm going to pose to you or a statement and I want to get your thoughts on it um, and tear it apart if, um, if, you, if you feel free. But are the two biggest obstacles to the peace process and a, and a two-state solution between Israel and Palestine um, um, Netanyahu and Hamas? Yes, but not. It's not. It's because it's, Netanyahu and Hamas won't be there forever. You know, like Netanyahu will eventually lose an election or resign, and Hamas will get replaced by something. You know, I think. I think beyond that, beyond what these two organisations are, it's, it is an issue of trust. There is like zero trust now between Israeli Palestinian people, and definitely between their their leaderships, both in in the West Bank and in Gaza. Um, and you can't have a peace process without trust because Anything that you would sign with the other side, if you believe the other side is not going to keep their commitment, they're not going to keep their security guarantee or remove their settlement or whatever agreement that you made, you wouldn't sign anything. And and I know, you know, I, I studied the, the peace process in Northern Ireland um, and actually took a group from Kids for Peace uh, there to, to, to talk to them. And I think one of the things that struck me most was we, we sat with a, a Catholic and a Protestant um, member of parliament in instalment in, in the... These are people that you know once were trying to kill each other, and now they 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 were both ministers in in their government, and and they said you know before we did our peace negotiations for the Good Friday Agreement, we sat, we talked about each other's families, and we had meals together, and we, you know, we built trust, and I feel like that's what's 
that's what's missing. And that's what we try and do with Kids for Peace as well. We try and build trust, build connections between families, celebrate each other's festivals together. That's that's like what I call soft power. Um, it's not hard power, but I think I think you can't have a peace process if you don't have the people behind it. And one of the reasons why Oslo blew up in everyone's faces is because you know the whole thing was done in secret when when the agreement was signed very few israelis and palestinians even knew that the negotiations had been happening for several years and in israel definitely whilst there was some support for for it initially you know as as the as the peace process went on became very unpopular and, and rabin was eventually assassinated um, and and also on the on the palestinian side you know they they felt that this was going to lead them to have an independent state of Palestine and and to not have settlements on their land. And they also didn't see that happening. And so then Hamas came with the terrorism and all the bus bombings and, and those sorts of things. So I think, yeah, I think the big thing is is trust and how do you build trust between the people that have two peoples that have been fighting for so, so long is is really, really hard. And the only way you can do that is through grassroots activism. But, uh, you know, we are we're a tiny minority in amongst a, a population that, that doesn't trust anyone. It's, and it's, you know, it's funny you mentioned Northern Ireland because I've been thinking about that in the days leading up to you and I having a conversation. I mean, that's my background. Um, yeah. And um, you're right. I mean, it, it, it was trust. And look, the, the Good Friday Agreement is, uh, it is an Im- imperfect agreement um and it's an yeah. imperfect peace in in the north but it's a stepping stone and it's getting closer and it is getting better and i was there in 2003 and i went back there last year and i noticed a difference yeah. in talking to folks on the ground it is it's changed a lot the new generation are coming through and there is there's greater intermingling between the different communities yeah the other thing that the good friday agreement um was successful in doing was everyone around that negotiating table had to compromise they had to give up things that were important to them and big things yeah. as well i think about the republican movement like they had to give up um the they had to create a constitutional amendment change that the the south had a claim on the north that about reunification that was a huge thing and the second thing was for uh for the republican movement to agree that the the people within the six counties of northern ireland could have self-determination now that's not an easy thing to do you know and i just look at what's going on in israel and palestine i think at this point in time i feel like they are so far this, this is probably the furthest point, and I'd be glad to get your thoughts on this. I feel like this is the furthest point they've ever been, the two communities, from from reaching any kind of uh, peace settlement. Um, mm. There's a study done by um, one of the think tanks in Washington that I'd read uh, a year or two ago that tracks attitudes between Jews and Arabs in the the in, in, in Israel and, and Palestine over the last 30 years, and it's got worse. Like there was a period in the early 2000s where you know 60 percent of palestinians and, and and israelis had a reasonably favorable opinion of each other but mm. it's got worse since then and, and i just think that's an absence of leadership on both sides um and i just yeah. and you, you know trying to find solutions here i mean you're right it is it's got to come from the grassroots but man the work that you're doing and the work that a whole bunch of other people are doing it feels like you're you're a kite dancing in the wind you know it's tough work yeah, look, you're right. We it, it is very hard work, and um, the the people are, uh, you know, I'd say peace now seems far more uh, removed and unlikely than you know any other time I can remember in in recent history, um, and that and that to me as a person living here and raising my children here is is very sad. I think, you know, uh, Daniel Gordas, uh, an American Israeli commentator, wrote a piece this week saying, you know, maybe we don't need peace. Maybe we can just live. Um, here without peace and just have a war every three to five years and then maybe that's our lot in life and maybe we should just give up on this on this dream of of peace because because we live in a neighborhood where our neighbors you know uh, there's no one to talk to and there's uh, you know we can't make compromises on things that are essential to us and 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 i think a lot of israelis feel that way um for, for palestinians not having peace means house demolitions it means potential evictions from their homes it means inequality it means um you know limits on on rights to work and travel from from gaza and the west bank so so for them not having peace is also not having equality as well which is also something that they they desperately want but you know um we we have a long way to go and it's very hard it's very hard to have hope um and when there's no hope that's when you get to violence you know hope is this like it's a very intangible thing, hope. 
um, because you can't you can't really put her in a bottle. But when someone believes that there, there's even a five percent chance that you can resolve this around the negotiating table, then they they say, okay, I, I hope it works. But then when it doesn't work, then you say, okay, what's my alternative? My alternative is is what war and violence and defend myself. Um, and then you get what you do. But, you know, a story I often tell is, you know, if you look at Australia, you know, I, I very much believe in marriage equality. And I remember there was a poll done in, in I think, 2004, you know, when this was an issue in, in the Labor Party as well. And uh, and I think like 40% or something supported marriage equality. And then by 2017, when we had the referendum, 61% supported marriage equality. And then I think, how did how did Australia change in you know, 15 years? How did 20% of the population shift from being against marriage equality to being in favour of it. Well, hundreds of people, you know, came out to their families and there were you saw LGBT people on TV and you saw major companies like Qantas and you know, you know, other companies coming out in favour of this and and there was a shift in 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 the public conversation that, that kind of shifted enough people that sixty one percent, you know, supported this and since the, the Gaza war ended, I saw two little things that gave me hope. The first was from Cellcom, which is like the Telstra of Israel. It's like a very big phone company. And they made a statement kind of saying Jews and Arabs refuse to be enemies and said any of our workers that want to strike for a day, um, you know, in solidarity with a, with a strike that was going on at the time for equality, you know, we, we support them. To, to be able to do that, even they didn't support the actual Arab strike, but they said that they could strike. And then Harel, which is like a huge insurance company, kind of like Perpetual, I guess, in Australia, they also took out huge billboards saying, you know, the best insurance against violence is coexistence. So you do have sort of some big companies now coming out and saying, look, we've, we've got to work out, you know, neither of us are leaving. You know, between, between the river and the sea now, there are 51% Jewish, 49% Arab. So it's, it's pretty much equal if you, if you look at the whole territory as, as one unit. And so we, we've got to work out a way to, to, to coexist and to live here with, with equality. Um, and it's, it's very much the, the long, long way ahead to, to get there. But I think that's what we need to struggle for. And I think our friends, anyone that cares about this place who doesn't live here should also be struggling for that as well with us. I mean, it certainly does get the attention, uh, and this particular um, flare-up has. Um, I mean, I don't know if social media was so prominent when the last time there was engagement between Israel and Hamas, but um, this time around, I did notice on social media um, that it um, everyone was, you know, sharing their memes and all that kind of stuff. Um, one thing I did notice, and I want to get your thoughts on this, and maybe we'll wrap it up after this, is that, you know if you believe sections of social media, particularly on the left, then there's this there's this narrative that Israel is a, is uh, an apartheid state. It's not a democracy. That its citizens are white European fascist colonizers illegally possessing the land of brown mm-hmm. people, Middle Eastern people, and the Zionists, backed by the United States, are the facilitators of this evil. Um, and when it all boils down to a narrative, you need a protagonist and you need an antagonist. And in this case, it's as simple as good versus evil. Um, it, uh, looking at that, what angered me was the, and and I did see the same on the sort of the Israeli side as well. I was getting a lot of um, sort of this narrative about um, about Arabs and and Palestinians and the like. Uh, it just makes it so much harder to try and find those um, the, the the peacemakers in this journey when. Social media is just driving even all of us around the world further and further apart because there's always, you know, <laughs> you read the comments, oh, my God, it's a shit fight. It's a, you know, it's, it's a dumpster fire of, of opinions and it just doesn't help what you guys, particularly, you know, the example of what you're doing uh, in Jerusalem with the Kids for Peace, it just yeah. it must just drive you insane trying to say, hey, guys, can we just try and keep some level head here? What, what, what's been your thoughts as you've been looking at social media and the role it's been playing in this yeah. conflict? Yeah, look, I think there's a lot of people who are not Israeli or Palestinian who view Israel-Palestine as a bit like a football match, like a Carlton Collingwood kind of thing where they, you know, you pick a team and then the other team is evil and then you barrack for your team no matter what they do. And then you lose all sense of complexity and nuance and then, and then you get sort of those tweets and Instagram infographics like, like you spoke there, um, and I, yeah, I don't think that's particularly helpful. In fact, I wrote an article about this um, just last week, saying, you know, if you want to understand Israel Palestine, go to a news site, like news sites that have journalists who are on the ground who are actually reporting. 
if, if you want an Arab Palestinian perspective, you can read Al Jazeera. If you want an Israeli perspective, you can read, you know, the Times of Israel, Haaretz, Jerusalem Post. There's many websites in English, but try and get your news from journalists, not from celebrities and Instagram infographics and and that sort of thing. But you know, the world, the way the world works is people unfortunately don't go to the news site. They look at their social media feeds or their TikTok or whatever, and then they and they think that what their friends post is what's news rather than actually going to 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 reading the news site. In, in in relation to the apartheid thing, so specifically with Sheikh Jarrah, there is an issue there that the law is not equal. The law that allows this family to um, to be removed from their home is a discriminatory law. So I understand why uh, a lot of people are opposed to that law, as, as am I personally as well. I don't think it's a fair law that, that allows you to commit an injustice today in order to avenge an injustice that was committed 70 years ago. I think that's a terrible principle to set in law because it, it can lead to a lot of people being removed from their laws. On the other hand, within the 67 borders, Israel is a democracy. Is there racism? For sure. Is there discrimination against Arab citizens? I think we can see that very, very, very clearly. And and in the same way that there's racism and discrimination in, in Australia against certain minorities, I'm sure many Indigenous Australians would say that Australia is, you know, still has has laws that they would consider racist about removal of children and, and those sorts of things as well. So um, it's a very flawed democracy, I would say, within Israel. In the West Bank and Gaza, it's not a democracy. The, the Jews in, in the West Bank who live in the settlements do have different rights from the Palestinians, even though they're neighbours in terms of, you know, access to, to water and resources and roads and, and all of these sorts of things. So is the whole country an apartheid state? I don't think so. But is there legal inequality in many parts of it? Yes, Israel would argue that that inequality is not racially based, which is true. It's not. It's not because you're black or white or anything like that. It's because Israel feels like those laws are necessary for security in order to protect uh, the Jews who live in the West Bank and in Israel. And the Palestinians would say that those laws are there to ethnically cleanse them and to remove them from their land and take their properties. And that's how those those two narratives uh, come about. Last question. Where do you go next with the work in terms of um, uh, kids for peace in Jerusalem off the back of a conflict such as this? Where do you start? So one of my colleagues, Suma, who I work with in Kids for Peace, lives in Sheikh Jarrah, and she, whilst not her family facing eviction, the next court case will be her, her house. And so, you know, it's, it's very difficult for, for her to work in, in a peace organisation when this is happening mm. to her family. Um, and and I also I feel terrible that my government is is doing this to her. And I know what she's experienced in the last few months with the with the riots and constant violence outside her house. There's now blockades in front of the neighbourhood, so even to get in and out of her house, she has to go through um, checkpoints uh, to get you know medicine for her father. Or, you know everything is is regulated by police. There was there was sadly a 16 year old girl who was shot in the back uh, last week uh, when she. Uh, she was in her house even, but a police officer shot, shot her in the back with a rubber bullet um, because he said that she, she didn't go into her house quickly enough. Um, and, and that policeman has been stood down now, but like, you know, horrific levels of, of violence in, in the neighbourhood at the moment, which, um, which I obviously want to see stop. So, look, I, I still believe in the work. I still believe that the only way you can end this conflict is by talking to one another and bringing people together. But I have to be honest, I'm in a minority. I'm not, I'm not the majority in this country, but I don't, I don't see any other way to make it better. Like if we, you know, because we're not going to, no one's going to force anyone out of their homes uh, as, as a long-term solution. That's, that's not how you're going to live here. That's just going to result in continued clashes and violence and, and all of those sorts of things. And I, I want to see Jerusalem be a home for all of its citizens. I don't think that's, I know that sounds like a radical thing to say now, but I, I think that's the, you know, everyone has to have equal rights, no matter what their religion, and, and everyone should be represented in the government as well. Like people, because that's what happens when you don't have political representation, and then you try and express yourself through other means, that you need to have a political system. I think there should be Arab parties in the coalition in Israel whether it's RAM or the joint list, right, left, I don't mind, but there has to be, everyone has to have a voice in the government that rules their lives. And, and if you don't have that voice, then you get to the, to the situation where we're in 
um, and uh, and to me that's that's not acceptable because I think I think we deserve to live in in peace and and so do the Palestinians. Here, here. Uh, is there any way in which Australians or uh, our listeners um, around the world can uh, ch- contribute or support the work that you guys are doing? I've put you on the spot there. I don't know sure we can donate or. Yeah. Um, but, uh, <laughs> Look, there there is there is something actually. There's I know I know when this happens, a lot of people call for for boycotting Israel or boycotting Hamas or boycotting the Palestinians or boycotting Iran. Like you know, a lot of people want to decide that they don't like. They want to withdraw funding and and you know all of those sorts of things. And and you know I understand why definitely Australia shouldn't be funding terrorist organisations and and aid money should be going to, to, you know, the right places. I don't know that's been issues in the past, but I would say beyond that, in addition to just boycotting, you should also be investing. Like Australia is not a, a major power in the world, but it is a, it is a mid power. And I think, I think there are organizations like ours connected to the Alliance for Middle East Peace called AllMap, um, where there's over a hundred NGOs working on the ground that recently there was a, the Nita Lowy bill in, in the U S talked about a major increase of funding to these peace organisations. And I think I think if Australians did want to help resolve the situation and, and also within the Labor Party, I think calling for more support for all MEP organisations that work on the ground, whether it's through Jewish Arab schools, through dialogue groups, through churches, synagogues, women's groups, um, groups that talk about equality and human rights, groups that educate children, to learn Hebrew, to learn Arabic, to, to see the other person as a human being, to, to the, you know, there's sports groups together, there's dance groups, basketball, you know, all, all sorts of things that I think um, that I think work on the ground. And, and just going back to Northern Ireland, you know, there was an international fund for peace in Northern Ireland that Kennedy, you know, established already in the 70s that, that really brought a lot of, you know, a lot of work was done through the churches to bring people together before there was any peace agreement that allow the grassroots. And when they had the referendum on on the Good Friday agreement, I think 71% voted in favour of it. So, you know, if today there was a referendum on peace, I can assure you the the, the numbers would not be 71%. So I think, I think if you want peace in 20 years, you've got to start now supporting people on the ground and also supporting leaders, calling for calm, calling for making statements, you know, that say... Israel should do all it can to stop the evictions from Sheikh Jarrah. Hamas has to stop firing rockets. Um, people need to stop making racist statements. People need to um, work together and restore peace and calm. And I think the more that that's said by the international community, um, the better, because I, I see that as an act of concern for the people that, that live here. And I think at least the Israeli government does listen to what friends like people um, in, in Australia will say because we know that people in Australia care about us and, and want us to be safe um, and want us to, to live in prosperity and harmony with our neighbours. Uh, so we need uh, more people like you over there. Um, thank you very much for coming on the show today. We do appreciate it. Um, and uh, if uh, maybe we'll um, put up a website or something in the, uh, in the description of today's episode where people can um, find out some more information about both articles to read on the issue uh, and also ways in which you can do- donate and support uh, the work of uh, yeah. Peace for Kids. Thank you very much. Yeah. Uh, thank you and, and wishing you well in Australia. I know you're in, you're in a lockdown again with your four cases or something there, but I hope you can all get vaccinated soon and that you can again... Uh, well, I, firstly, I want to visit Australia. <laughs> it's very hard for me to do that right now, but also that you can visit here as well. Good stuff. Good stuff.